I know we're all busy talking about the border and the economy and the wars overseas, but the Libs over at the Atlantic are celebrating a new frontier in public policy, largely unnoticed, and that is prescribing away your Second Amendment rights. Here's the headline. The doctor will ask about your gun now. Just a paragraph or two. A man comes to Northwell Health's hospital on Staten Island with a sprained ankle. Any allergies, the doctor asks. How many alcoholic drinks do you have each week? Do you have access to firearms inside or outside the home? When the patient answers yes to that last question, someone from his care team explains that locking up the firearm can make his home safer. She, of course it's a she, offers him a gun lock and a pamphlet with information on secure storage and firearm safety classes. And all of this happens during the visit about his ankle. Northwell Health is part of a growing movement of healthcare providers that want to talk with patients about guns, like they would diet, exercise, or sex, treating firearm injury as a public health issue. In the past few years, the White House has declared firearm injury an epidemic, and the CDC and the National Institutes of Health have begun offering grants for prevention research. Meanwhile, dozens of medical societies agree that gun injury is a public health crisis and that health care providers have to help stop it. As they say, this policy has been building for some time, largely unnoticed. This is part of a much broader agenda. This is not about your ankle, and this is not about your alcoholic drinks, and this is not even totally about your guns. This is about the liberals pathologizing your rights, beliefs, and way of life so they don't have to debate them and they don't need to recognize them. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. Trump has nine lives. He does, that's not true. He has 90 lives. He has 900 lives. President Trump, at the last moment, has just posted the $175 million bond that was required to prevent the New York Attorney General, Letitia James, from stealing his buildings. She was there. She was so close. Wiley Coyote was just about to take Trump Tower, and then Roadrunner Donald got away. We will get to that in just a moment. First, though, speaking of science and progress, the uh, governor of uh, Michigan, this is Gretchen Whitmer, uh, is She's a big promoter of science. All the liberals are big promoters of science. And, and so their public policy, it's just a matter of science. It's not a matter of eternal questions and first principles and public debate and your preferences and your right to govern yourself. It's just a matter of science. And so Gretchen Whitmer was asked about an increasingly controversial public policy question, and that is, the surrogacy industry, the baby store, and IVF, which, which really come down to the same questions we've been dating, d- debating with abortion for a long time, which is, does human life really begin at the beginning of human life? Well, by definition, it does. Okay, then are we going to treat the humans like humans, or are we going to treat them like products to buy and sell? Or are we going to treat them like trash or, or like a pathogen to be destroyed? What, how do we treat people? Uh, Gretchen Whitmer has asked this specifically about the surrogacy industry. Here's her answer. On that ruling in Alabama, you have not said whether or not you agree that that frozen embryos are considered people. What is your position on that? You know, I, it, who cares what my position is, Kaylin? <laughs> what matters is what the parents um, and their doctor agree is is whatever is right for them, how they define it. That's the only one whose opinion should matter. Not a judge, not a politician, not a governor from a different state. That's what the fundamental question is here. Are we going to empower Americans to make their own health care decisions and make decisions about how they go about starting their family and whether or not they go about starting a family? And that's what I'm fighting for here in Michigan. Oh, okay. Pretty weak sauce, Governor. The question that CNN is asking is, 
hey, governor, do you think as a matter of law, we ought to be able to slaughter babies or alternately put them in a freezer forever? And the governor of the state of Michigan says, what are you asking me for? I'm just a governor. I just make laws. Why are you asking me what I think the law should be? No, no, I don't want to answer that. It doesn't matter what I think. I'm just the governor that people elected to make the laws. So stop asking me about the laws. No, no, all that matters is what the doctors say with their patients, which is that it's liberals playing a little trick here. It's a little bit of a shell game. They're, they're trying to hide their politics. They're trying to hide their political philosophy. They're trying to hide their active measures in public life behind the uh, facade of science. That's not my opinion. It's just the science. But it's, this isn't this isn't my political action. It's just it's just individual rights or something like that. No, there's no one has ever seriously believed that there isn't a, a totally protected individual right to kill your babies or lock them in a freezer forever in America. It's a, it's a novel question brought about by a novel technology that draws on eternal principles and debates. And we elect public servants to make the laws for us and help to resolve some of those debates. The, 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 the politicians are an expression of the desires of the people and we elect them in part for their judgment, but they don't want to give us their judgment when they know that the answer is ghastly. Gretchen Whitmer wants to avoid the question here because she knows that it's kind of a lose-lose. Either she says, yeah, we're not, you can't just slaughter all the babies and, or throw them in a freezer forever, which alienates her infanticidal Democrat base, or she says, yeah, kill them all, kill all those babies, we're going to get them, which uh, obviously alienates the moderates and the independents who don't think it's a great idea to go to the baby store and then kill them or freeze them willy-nilly. So she says, well, no, it's actually, it's, are you kidding me? It's not up to me. This is the conclusion of, of uh, a pol political order based on slogans from the sitcom Friends. You remember Friends popularized that dumb slogan, no uterus, no opinion. <laughs> oh, you men, you think you get to have an opinion in our self-government? over whether or not we murder a bunch of babies? Uh, no, if you don't have a uterus, then you don't get to use your reason and your conscience to determine whether or not we slaughter a bunch of infants in our ostensibly self-governing republic. Uh, no, you do. You do, actually. You can, I, I can have an opinion on all sorts of things that uh, will affect me more or less directly because I'm a citizen and I, I have reason. She knows her answers are ghastly, so she has to she has to abstract. Oh, it's just reason. It's just science. It's just progress. It's just it's just there's no political debate to be had. There is. There have been plenty of societies that slaughter kids, whether for the purposes of eugenics or for the purposes of supposed individual liberation or just because of uh, cruel prejudices. Plenty of them. But let's not pretend that this is not controversial. Let's not pretend that you don't have an opinion. Gretchen Whitmer. Let's not, let's not pretend that the question of whether or not we get to protect ourselves with our Second Amendment rights, how we get to use the natural right to self-defense, that that's not a political question. It's what they want to do by taking, by, by promoting the technocracy and by, by pathologizing and scientifying, that's a new word that I'm making, scientify, scientizing all of the political questions. It's just a way to take the, the political matters out of the realm of debate and to shut you up. Now, you don't want to be shut up. You don't want to be spied on. You don't, wanna, you don't want to be totally controlled by an oppressive political order. One way to fight back against it is ExpressVPN. Go to expressvpn.com slash Knowles. Does it make sense that the same company that controls half of online retail also passively eavesdrops on your private conversations at home. It is time to put a layer of protection between your online activity and these tech juggernauts. That is why I use ExpressVPN. Think about how much of your life is on the internet. Sadly, every site you visit, the emails you send and receive, videos you watch, or messages you send get tracked and data mined. But when you run ExpressVPN on your device, the software hides your IP address so that big tech cannot use it to identify you personally. ExpressVPN makes your activity harder to trace and sell to advertisers. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your internet data 
to keep you safe from hackers and eavesdroppers on your network. ExpressVPN is so easy to use, I can do it. You just press one button, boom, you're protected on your phone, on your computer, on your tablet. It's fabulous. Stop handing over your personal data to the big tech monopoly that mines your activity and sells your info. Protect yourself with a VPN that I trust to keep me safe online. That is expressvpn.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. To get three extra months free, go to expressvpn.com slash Knowles right now to learn more. Speaking of science and progress, another Democrat politician, Pete Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation. He's returned from maternity leave. He is now going on Fox News. And he is explaining how important it is for Americans to give up the cars that they like to buy a bunch of dumb electric cars that many people don't like. Well, let's be clear. Consumers have wanted and purchased more EVs every single year than the year before. And, uh, you know, Tesla is facing more competition as GM and Ford and Stellantis and other competitive players uh, start to make sure they get a piece of the EV market. Let's be clear that uh, the automotive sector is moving toward EVs, and we can't pretend otherwise. Sometimes when these debates happen, I feel like it's the early 2000s, and I'm talking to some people who uh, think that we can just have landline phones forever. Uh, The reality is that the automotive sector is moving toward EVs, and the U.S. can either fall behind China or we can claim the lead. It's it's just happening, guys. What? Do you want? Imagine if we just clinged to landline phones, (laughs) haha, forever. That's a terrible analogy, because in in the case of electric vehicles versus regular cars, the the electric vehicles are much closer to the landline phones, and the gasoline-powered cars are much closer to the cell phones. People like cell phones because they get to move around with them. They can take their phone calls anywhere. It gives them a lot more choice and mobility. The landline kind of tethers you and limits your ability to move, just as the electric vehicle does. You can't go on a cross-country road trip willy-nilly with an electric vehicle because the range isn't long enough. And once you run out, you're even on the best electric cars, you run out your 200-mile range at best, you're going to have to pause and then sit at, at the electric charging station for, even with the best cars, what, half an hour, maybe longer for the cheaper electric cars? It's not practical. You're not going on a road trip in that. You get a good old gas guzzling car, you just drive, you hit the open road, and then your tank gets a little low, you pull over to one of the bazillion gas stations in America, you fill up, you're on the road again in less than five minutes. It's true that electric vehicles are newer, I guess, just as cell phones are newer than landlines, but it doesn't make them preferable. Not every new idea, not every new product is better than the old one. That is the prejudice of progress. That is Pete Buttigieg doing the exact same thing that Gretchen Whitmer is trying to do, doing the exact same thing that the libs at the CDC are trying to do with guns. They're they're trying to pretend that that their vision of left-wing progress is inevitable. (laughs) Well, actually, guys, you know, the country, it's just moving toward electric cars. No, you're trying to make it move toward electric cars, and people don't want to. Um, actually, (laughs) you know, the, uh, uh, we, we've sold more electric vehicles this year than any year in the past. Yeah, what, you sold like five last year and you sold four the year before. I mean, it's a little bit higher than that. But the, the reason he's even going on TV now to desperately defend electric vehicles is because even Tesla, Tesla, which is sexy and cool, and it's run by the wackiest super genius billionaire that we've seen in our lifetimes, even Tesla is seeing declining sales. And he's trying to talk up Ford and Chevy. Ford and Chevy EVs are a complete joke. It, people don't really want this stuff. Even the really super sexy Tesla car, even that people are are not that into, at least not yet. S- stop trying to make this happen, but they won't stop trying to make it happen. And even worse, they won't stop gaslighting all of us and pretending that it's just happening naturally. The reason that there is any electric vehicle purchasing going on in the U.S. is because the government is heavily subsidizing these cars because the government hates gasoline and the government hates oil the government run by the liberals and they hate it because of their fears of the sun monster and they hate it because of their weird prejudices and they hate it because they want to pay off their friends that happen to work in the green industry. Whatever the the reasons for it, they are very actively through politics pushing these dumb electric cars that most people don't want. And then that's fair enough. I guess that's politics, but they have the audacity to look us in the face and say, oh no, 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 this is just history. This is just science. This is just progress. 
No, it's not. I don't even have an opinion about guns. No, no, it's just the doctors say. The science says. Oh, no, I don't have an opinion about whether you should go to the baby store and buy a baby and then kill someone and throw them in a freezer. It's just the science. No, it's not. Own your own opinion. But they won't own their own opinion, which tells you a whole lot about their opinions, which is their opinions are largely indefensible. So they have to, they have to remove themselves from them, including Mayor Pete. Does, it is not backed up by consumer preferences. It is not backed up by history. The electric vehicle keeps dying. It keeps flopping. It is not backed up by logic. The gasoline cars are just much more versatile. They're, they're simply preferable right now to the electric vehicles. So they got to lie. They got to lie and just kind of force us. Now, speaking of progress, it's not only the Democrats I want to knock today. Sometimes the Republicans, they, they drive me crazier than the Democrats. There's a Republican attorney general in Oklahoma. Uh, this attorney general, Gentner Drummond, uh, just personally argued a case before the Oklahoma Supreme Court against a Catholic charter school in his state. Huh? What? You got a, you got a Republican attorney general who is looking at the development of charter schools. I don't know. I'm Call me a crazy old-fashioned conservative and Republican. I thought that was good. He's looking specifically at a religious school, a traditional Christian school in his state. Catholic schools have probably the best track record of education in the entire history of the West. He's looking at that. And he's saying, mm, I'm going to fight that. Of all the things I'm going to fight today, this is what I'm going to fight. And why is he going to fight it? He's going to fight it Because he is opposed to taxpayer-funded religion. This is a man, he's a real Republican. He's a man who wants a firm separation between church and state. He's a real conservative. That's why he's going to push for what? Totally secular education, totally secular public life with conservatives like this who needs liberals. And then what's his specific argument? That's what he says. Today, Oklahomans are being compelled to fund Catholicism because of the legal precedent created by the board's actions. Tomorrow, we may be forced to fund radical Muslim teachings like Sharia law. If we, if we, as conservatives, permit and encourage public Christian-tinged education, next thing you know, we're going to have Sharia law in Oklahoma. Are you kidding me? So absolutely pathetic. There is a criticism sometimes of conservatives that the only thing we conserve is the liberal policies of five years ago. This guy proves it. This guy proves it. The total separation of church and state, the total secularization of society, that's not a, lib- that's not a conservative policy. That is a very, very liberal policy, a very new liberal policy that only begins to crop up in the middle of the 20th century. The notion that we can't have taxpayer-funded religious instruction, you know, Bible in schools, we can't have that. This is America. That's an extremely liberal left-wing policy. And you got this guy, this Republican, Gertner Gentner Drummond, arguing it as Mr. Rock-Ribbed Conservative. Absolutely pathetic. Now, what's his, what's his fear? His fear is, well, you know, look, the moment, look, maybe Catholicism's fine, but uh, how are we to make a distinction between Catholicism and Islam? Uh, I don't know. We did it pretty well for the first 200 years of our nation's history. Uh, how, how can we tell the difference between traditional Catholic education and Sharia law? Uh, I don't know, because we're not complete idiots and we have uh, faculties of reason and discernment and judgment. How about that? We're not just complete dummies, and we can tell the difference between one thing and a thing that is very different from that first thing? Are you kidding me? Listen, if the Attorney General of Oklahoma can't tell the difference between a traditional Christian education, which has been the backbone of America when we've been successful, the backbone of our whole civilization, and Sharia law, then resign, because you clearly don't know anything. No, no, but his fear is, no, no, maybe I, I can tell the difference, but you know, we can't make these kinds of distinctions in public life. If, if we fund a Christian display somewhere, well, we're going to have to fund the satanic display that we saw in that state capital about two or three months ago. Uh, yeah, no, we don't. 
We don't, actually. We have had public Christian displays for all of American history. And for most of American history, we have not tolerated satanic displays. And we've had a nice policy of religious toleration, and it has come up organically through the uh, culture and the traditions uh, from our country, which was founded by extremely zealous Christians of varying sects and denominations. And it's worked out just fine. And we don't need to be so obtuse as this attorney general in Oklahoma is being, and we can acknowledge that we can make distinctions between these things, and we don't need to just cede the entire educational apparatus to the libs to make some dumb hypothetical point about Sharia law in Oklahoma. Well, to stop this hypothetical problem that is almost certainly never going to happen in Oklahoma, of all places, we're going to cede the entire educational ground. By the way, the educational sector is pro- one of the most important aspects of a society because it crafts the future of your society for generations. Yeah, we're going to see that whole thing to the atheists and the secularists and the liberals because I'm afraid that uh, Mohammed bin Salman is going to invade Oklahoma and implement Sharia law with conservatives like this. Who needs liberals? Now, speaking of policies, some of which are better than others. When you want to pick a really good policy, you got to check out Policy Genius. Go to policygenius.com slash Knowles. Spring is here, baby. With all the changes happening outside, there's no better time to start shopping for life insurance with Policy Genius as part of your financial planning for the year. Getting life insurance today means you will have peace of mind so that if something were to happen to you, your family could recover expenses while getting back on their feet. Policy Genius helps you compare your options from top companies and their team of licensed experts is on hand to help talk you through it. Policy Genius is licensed, award-winning agents and technology that make it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. Even if you already have a life insurance policy through work, it might not offer enough protection for your family's needs. It might not follow you if you leave your job. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for a million bucks worth of coverage. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Save time and money. Provide your family with financial safety net using Policy Genius. Go to policygenius.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. Policygenius.com slash Knowles. Speaking of schools, an Illinois high school has just decided to create gender-neutral bathrooms. We all know about gender-neutral bathrooms. You might see them in your workplace. You might see them in a college or university. Now we're starting to see them in high schools. This clip comes to us by way of our friends over at Libs of TikTok. This is a clip from Edwardsville High School debating the policy. A passionate debate over millions of dollars going toward building new gender neutral bathrooms at Edwardsville High School. Some parents and others upset over this idea. Uh, Who watches the watchers? But using our tax money, money that I earned to do something I oppose is just so wrong. Shouldn't even be a consideration. Uh, it's, It's wasting the public's time. Thank you. But others, including a current transgender student, argue the opposition is fear-mongering and that these bathrooms are safe. From my experience as a transgender man, I rarely have ever felt safe in a public restroom. This is an excellent opportunity to validate them as they are, to make education a safe space for them. I commend the board on moving forward with this. I encourage you to do so, and I thank you for your time. Take a look at your screen. These are renderings of the common area bathrooms boys and girls would share at Edwardsville High featuring private, fully enclosed stalls for each student. Okay. Put aside for a second what we know about the implementation of transgender bathrooms, the really dark stuff, uh, like the Loudoun County story, which the Daily Wire broke, which helped to get Glenn Youngkin elected governor of Virginia where in the name of pro-trans policies, the school allowed men to go into the women's bathroom and a girl got raped there. And then, because they didn't want it to become a big news story, the superintendent just moved the kid to a different school. Guess what? He did it again. Put aside the really evil and dangerous uh, effects of this policy that we have already seen, the political effects of which we've already seen, namely the election of a Republican in pretty blue Virginia. Just take yourself back to high school. 
you're back in high school, hormones coming out of your pores, you know, looking for an opportunity to go uh, steal away for a little bit during the day with your honey. <laughs> and then you find out that you, you're you now, you and your girlfriend or you and your boyfriend can just like hightail it into the bathroom in between classes. And do you think that's going to, do you think it's going to turn out well is all I'm asking. I'm not saying that every kid is going to, but do you think just using your common sense that taking uh, kids who are uh, the most brimming with hormones, uh, probably the least able to control their lusts and attractions to the opposite sex that they will ever be in their entire lives. Do you think giving them a private area uh, in which people are regularly undressing, where there are no cameras, where there's no no prying eyes of the security guards or the teachers or the counselors, to just go and like kind of just steal away for a little bit? Do you think that's a good idea? I would say probably, and this is my own experience of high school and just remembering... Just kind of knowing how boys and girls interact with each other, that would seem like a bad idea to me. Every sober-minded person forever would have recognized that that's probably not the wisest idea. So why are we promoting this now? The only way that one could come to the conclusion that it's a good idea to let boys and girls go off privately in school in a a shared space without any supervision uh, now is because we have systematically denied common sense basic facts about human nature for so many decades now. The whole reason that this is a political issue now is because we've got to pretend that a boy can become a girl, which everyone knows isn't true. When the when the girl gets up there and speaks at the school board meeting and says, you know, as a as a trans man, I just don't feel safe. And you you pity the girl because she's so confused and she's been totally failed by her family and by her community. You you want to tell her, no, girl, the, your problem is not that you're, they're not letting you into the opposite bathroom. Your problem is that you're living totally out of accord with reality, and and you're you're pursuing your and they're being affirmed by people around you. No one thinks that that girl is being set up to flourish. Or that guy, they need to be affirmed as who they are. The whole point of education is to help you to better see the truth and to make sense of your freedom and to live in accord with reality and to flourish. And this this guy is saying, well, really for education, we just need to make sure that these people are allowed to live in fantasy land ever more so every single day. That's the opposite of education. That's called maleducation. That's just the first part. Then we have to deny that sometimes teenagers get up to bad stuff. That when boys and girls, as teenagers, get close to each other and there's no supervision, uh, sometimes, you know, they get a little frisky. We have to deny We have to deny all of these things because those facts are not politically correct or they're deemed offensive to some people or they just don't uh, accord with the liberal utopian vision. So the consequence is going to be, now we're, we're not, now we're not even going to be able to conserve the men and women's bathroom in high schools in high schools. And then I guarantee you, you're going to see squish Republicans 10 years from now, who they're going to sound like the attorney general of Oklahoma. They're going to say, hey, wait a second. Can you believe these radical Leninist uh, leftists are trying to take away our transgender bathrooms? They're trying to create a new series of transhuman bathrooms. I Listen, I'm a conservative. I want my good old fashioned transgender bathrooms. I'm, you know, I'm a conservative. I'm a right winger. Uh-huh really, really pathetic. If we don't, uh, without fear, with some courage, articulate eternal truths, we're sunk. We're not going to conserve anything. Might as well give it up. Now, moving on from the, the social engineering ambitions of the left, so focused on it, they forget about human nature. Uh, we got to stick on the weird trans stuff for a second because Democrat political strategists are recognizing that this issue, specifically Biden's uh, exaltation of the Trans Day of Visibility on Easter Sunday, is a bad look. And it it doesn't play well in Peoria. And this is already going to be a close election. Most voters don't like this stuff. Here is veteran Democrat strategist James Carver. James Carver, Louisiana. Economy, stupid. Come on, man. You know, that guy trying to defend Biden as best he can, and to position the Democrats as the party of common sense. Let's see if he succeeds. Well, I honestly think it's profoundly stupid. 
as if Biden even knew it was transgender awareness day. By the way, Biden goes to mass and communion every week, as you well know. You couldn't find Trump in inside of a church anywhere. This, I, I really think this is utterly absurd. I don't think anybody in the White House was, was aware of this. As you point out, it's a, it's a, it's a constant day. It's on March 31st. And I don't know anywhere in Trump's Bible where Jesus tells me to hate trans people or gay people, any other people. Okay, that was a lot. That was a lot of spaghetti at the wall kind of defense. But what does it boil down to? The defense that the legendary Democrat strategist is mounting for Joe Biden calling Easter Sunday trans day of visibility is one, Joe Biden's a vegetable and he has no idea what his administration is doing. He didn't know it was trans visibility day. He doesn't know anything. Doesn't know what his name is. You can't blame Joe Biden. He doesn't know. He probably didn't wake up on Easter Sunday. That's one. Number two, he Trump's bad. That's it, basically. He says, he says uh, Biden goes to mass every Sunday and receives communion. He should not receive communion because he's in a persistent state of grave mortal sin because, among other things, of his scandalous public support for infanticide, which is a non-negotiable political issue for the Holy Catholic Church. Among, among other issues, that would be one of them. So he, Carville says, you know, this is evidence that he's a, a practicing and pious and devout Catholic. Quite the opposite. It's quite scandalous. And he was just rebuked by his own cardinal, a, a liberal cardinal, Wilton Cardinal Gregory, for this, for ignoring important aspects of uh, Catholic teaching. Don't forget, the Catholic faith is not like a lot of religions, which are, are kind of more individual focused and you do you and follow your conscience. You know, always let your conscience be your guide. Obviously, there's a role for conscience, but the Catholic faith is dogmatic, hierarchical. There are priests and bishops and a pope. There is authority here, and the authorities are saying, hey, Joe Biden, you you need to repent. You are not doing this correctly, but he ignores that. doesn't matter. James Carville, that point is totally lost on him. He said, Ned got Donald Trump. He's real bad. He's a bad guy. He's a bad guy. Yeah, okay. Wow. Okay, if that's your best defense— then I feel pretty good about Republicans' chances in November. I'm sure there are actually some circumstances now that are, that are making me feel a little less good. But, but if it were a totally fair election and this were the debate, this is the best the Democrats have. The president has no idea what's going on and Trump is a, is a meanie. Or, the orange man is bad. Wow, they got nothing. They got nothing on any political issue and they got no way to defend their guy. Meanwhile, and then, and then we'll move on from Trans Day of Visibility until the Democrats announce it again next year. Who knows? Maybe they'll, maybe they'll do it on Christmas Day next year. Uh, there was this priestess. Uh, who I don't know what denomination she purports to be a pastoress of, but uh, this priestess lady was celebrating, specifically from a Christian perspective, the Trans Day of Visibility. Happy Transgender Day of Visibility. It is coming up this Sunday. And so for all of my trans friends, I am sending so much love to you. Everyone who is able to be visible as their most authentic self. And for those of you for whom that's not a possibility right now, I want you to know that at least in spirit, I see you and I'm cheering you on. Please remember that you are lovable and you are loved. Okay. Forget about what she says about the trans thing for a second. I, I really don't even mention this to harp on the trans issue that no one can cease from talking about for the last decade. I want to talk about the collar. I don't want to even talk about what she says. I want to talk about who she is and how she dresses. This woman is not a priest <laughs> because women can't be priests. <laughs> and uh, she's certainly not a Catholic priest, though she's dressed up like one. And she's put the collar on with the, with the pseudo cassock, you know, the cassock dress kind of. I, why is she doing that? Why is she doing that? She's a liberal. Her religious views, in as much as I can understand them at all, seem to be some kind of weird Gnosticism that says that your body has nothing to do with your true self. And this is a heresy that's cropped up many times in history. Okay, a lot of people have believed it. But why pretend to be a priest? When Cardinal Gregory was on CBS yesterday, we played that clip on the show, and there was that bishopress lady, <laughs> this priestess pretending to be a prelate with the collar in it. Why? why? why if you're going to be a liberal and you're going to articulate a Gnostic 
modern liberal view of human nature, why not just be that? Why not dress up in that uniform? Which I guess that uniform is what? Like ripped jeans and purple colored hair or something? Why, why not? Why do you have to pretend to be a thing that is totally contrary to the views that you are articulating? There's an answer to it. Authority. They need some authority. Every political movement needs authority. Because otherwise, to quote the Big Lebowski, you know, <laughs> that's just kind of like your opinion, man. <laughs> uh, so they, you need to ground any political movement in authority. And for, for these libs, they want to steal the authority of Christianity. They, they recognize that there is a power to the church. The church, whether you love the church or hate the church, it's the only institution from antiquity that still exists. And that remains strong for all the scandals and all the problems. And all, it actually remains very strong. How is that? That's, I don't know. There's, there's something to it. Love it or hate it. As Chesterton pointed out, it can't just be nothing. It can't just be mid. You know, it's either got to be really, really good or really, really bad, but it's got it, but it's remarkable. And the libs know that. And so they, they try to steal that authority a little bit. I, I think very unpersuasively. I don't think that lady's fooling anyone. She could even put on a bishop's hat. You know, I don't think, I still don't. She could dress up like the Pope. I don't think anyone's going to buy it for one second. But the fact that they have to play dress up like this, the fact that they have to, you know, even beyond religion, that they wrap themselves in the flag, that they, that they have the aesthetics of a kind of tradition, the tone of a kind of tradition, even as they try to undermine that. It tells you a lot about where they know that the people are and, and what, what they know the people want to follow. You know, the Daily Wire decided to give my friend Matt Walsh a robe, a gavel, and an all-new series. Introducing Judged by Matt Walsh on Daily Wire Plus. I have been as excited for this series as I have been for any new series. Uh, this has been in the works for quite a long time. We've all kept our mouths shut about it. Matt Walsh, as a judge, is as hilarious as you would imagine. Shockingly, the cases are real. The people you see are real. And yes, his decisions are legally binding. I'm not joking. Take a look at the official trailer for the new Daily Wire Plus series, Judged by Matt Walsh, now. All rise for the Honorable Judge Walsh. Please be seated. Ms. Goldstein. Mr. Bentley. Yeah. Mr. Outerbridge. Ms. Spicer. Your Honor. Mr. Barney. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Singh. Yeah. At 30,000 feet, my lips exploded. Why would I pay rent to somebody who had sex with my sister? A dog bit my finger. He's allergic, like the grass. If he didn't want me to drive the car, he would have took the key. I had it with him. Has anyone told you you're the worst negotiator that's ever lived? I've never been more annoyed than I am in this moment. Not even close. That does it. Please get the hell out of my courtroom. <laughs> Wait until you see real petty court in action where anything that you say to Judge Walsh can and certainly will be held against you. <laughs> be the first to see Judged by Matt Walsh Tuesday, April 9th at 8 p.m. Eastern on Daily Wire Plus. Don't have a Daily Wire Plus membership? Get it now for 35% off with code JUDGED at checkout. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe. My favorite comment yesterday is from Boston Man 645 who says, the just war theory is only applied to Israel. Which actual war followed it ever? The Iraq war? This is a nonsensical argument of isolationists. Uh, no, it's not, <laughs> actually. Uh, just war theory is um, ethics applied to military action that has existed since antiquity everywhere with different shades and different flavors and some disagreements about it, but, but everywhere, all over the whole world. India, Asia, East Asia, uh, North Africa, Egypt, uh, obviously in our own civilization, begins really with Aristotle. Uh, Cicero contributes to it, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, many, many thinkers into modernity. It's the notion that the, the moral order imposes some rules for, well, for rules for everything, and that doesn't exclude war. In fact, it especially pertains to war. Uh, 
Just war theory is opposed to two errors when it comes to war. What, the one error being pacifism, the notion that war is always bad, man, give peace a chance, all war is evil. That's not, that's not true. That's not morally serious. You don't have a moral obligation to let the cruel rape the earth. You have a right to defend yourself So in, and, and other rights, actually. When it, when it comes to war. So pacifism is fake. But then on the other end, there is, there's an extreme kind of chauvinism or nationalism, which says that uh, you can do whatever you want for your country and you're not really bound by the moral order at all. And you can commit atrocities and you can do whatever you like and it doesn't matter as long as you pursue your own national interest. That is also wrong and immoral and uh, no serious statesman has ever believed it. Some some have pursued it, but no one no one could really, who has any use of his reason, could really believe that. So there are some rules that derive from the moral order, which all serious people recognize. And that does not just pertain to one nation or a couple of nations. It pertains to all of them. That's just how it is, man. Now, speaking of political authority and grounding political authority in religion, President Trump coming out swinging to win up all those Christian votes. The libs have spent what? three years now, talking about the rise of Christian nationalism. The Christian fascists are trying to reimpose the golden rule in politics. It's a terrible, scary thing. Trump tweets out, or Truth Social's out, Election Day, November 5th, will be the most important day in the history of our country. It will also be Christian Visibility Day, the biggest turnout of Christians in the history of our country. DonaldJTrump.com. I love this. Trump, he's really good at painting pictures. He's really good at drawing contrasts. Biden stands for Trans Visibility Day. Biden disses Christians on the holiest day in the Christian liturgical calendar. Biden's going to celebrate this false anthropology that says boys can become girls. He's the trans visibility candidate. Well, you know what? Trump's going to be the Christian visibility candidate. And so what he's really saying is if you're a Christian, you got to vote for Trump. Like when Biden says, if you're black and you're not voting for me, you ain't black. Trump is, I think, implying here, if you're a Christian, you're not voting for me, maybe you ain't Christian. This is, I'm, I'm the one who is protecting the view of Christians and the uh, Christian spirit that has animated our country for a very long time. And, and I think he's right. I mean, getting back to the non-negotiable political issues for the faith, if any political issue is non-negotiable, it would be the right to life. Any conception of rights you can come up with, certainly the one that's articulated in our Declaration of Independence, requires a defense of life. Even Thomas Jefferson writes, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, there's a there's an order to those. You wouldn't say the pursuit of happiness is the most important, followed by liberty, followed by life. That would be nonsensical because if you have if you don't have life, if you're deprived of your right to life, then you can't have liberty or happiness. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't say the pursuit of happiness is, comes before liberty because without liberty, you can't pursue happiness. So it's in that order for a reason. Life comes first, then liberty, then the pursuit of happiness. And that's just, that's just one perspective on natural rights and natural law. That's the Jefferson Declaration perspective. Many, many others. It's a non-negotiable. To quote St. John Paul II, uh, the right to life is not just one right among many, but it's the fundamental right, the, the prerequisite life on, on which all the other rights rely. You got to protect it. Biden doesn't. Biden thinks you ought to be able to kill your kid at any point, and you ought to, at least any point until he's born or, or maybe slightly after he's born, and that you ought to be able to buy kids and sell kids and throw kids in freezers forever. That's, what, that's his view. That's his publicly articulated view. And Trump says, nah. Trump's a little bit um, ambiguous right now on the issue of IVF. It's a novel issue. One hopes he receives good advice. Uh, certainly when it comes to the issue of abortion, he's the most pro-life president ever, and he's the guy who got Roe v. Wade overruled. And he's the first president to, to address the March for Life. And elections are binary choices, and this is not a complex one for Christians. He's saying that his win is a win for Christians. And all politics is fundamentally theological, and Trump is embracing that. And he might be a thrice-married lapsed Presbyterian, and all sorts of politicians have problems, but 
you can insult him and attack him any way you want. The facts are the facts. If you, if you, want, if you want your country to go trans and lib and Gnostic, vote for Biden. If you want your country to maintain and one hopes restore even some of its Christian identity, vote for Trump. Simple as. Very, very true. Now, I mentioned earlier, Trump has nine lives. I don't know why. That's, that's uh, also a kind of crazy religious view. I mean, what is that? Karma, reincarnation? I don't, whatever it is, though, the clearest evidence for it ever is Donald Trump just keeps surviving. Just when the libs think they've got him, he just somehow survives. Right before the New York Attorney General, Letitia James, was licking her lips to steal some of Trump's buildings, he posts the 100 $75 million bond to prevent New York from seizing his assets. Nine lives, 90 lives, 900 lives. We were going through on the show all the different maneuvers that he might try to make to keep, because they're prosecuting him. Prosecutions haven't really worked so far or, or looked up for the liberals. So then they go after him in civil judgments and they then they fine him for 350 million some odd dollars, but then he can't pay it right away because no one has that kind of cash lying around, not even Elon Musk. So they add all these crazy fines. Get it up to over $450 million. Then it looks like they got him and a judge reduces that. And then, but still it's going to be tough to come up with that money. Well, what do you know? Just as this is happening, Trump's eccentric social media platform goes public and his net worth increases by $3 billion in one day. What, where is the, I mean, just, we're talking about unprecedented historic stuff and a, a, a mark of coincidence. Some might call it providence. That seems to me unmistakable. And he's done it again. He gets to keep his buildings. He lives to see another day and to fight out the election. Still, the Democrats are contending. It is obvious, it's obvious that Joe Biden's going to win. Here is Mrs. Biden. How is the campaign going before Oh my go? gosh, it's going great. I have been traveling every day that I'm not in the classroom. People are excited. Um, and I really feel like, you know, people know the choice this election. They can choose chaos or they can choose you know, steady wisdom experience. So it's not a part of you that's a little worried because no, it seemed to be no, off kilter a little no, bit. No, okay. I feel that Joe will be reelected. But when these polls like the Wall Street Journal one land in the White House and he's losing in all the battleground states. That... No, he's not losing in all the battleground all but one. states. He's coming up and he's um, even or doing better. So mm. you know what? Once people start to focus in and they see their two choices, mm -hmm. it's obvious that Joe will win this election. All right. Okay, obviously she's going to defend her husband. That's her job. It's appropriate for her to do that. But is that all we're seeing here? Is this just a woman defending her husband? Or is Joe Biden genuinely comfortable, confident, relaxed that Joe is going to win? Are the Demo Take Joe Biden out of it. Are the Democrats comfortable, confident, relaxed that Joe Biden is going to win? Right now, some of the Democrats look a little nervous, but they seem a lot less freaked out than they should be, which makes me ask, do they know something that we don't know? I saw some numbers come out yesterday. Democrats are registering voters in swing states in extremely high numbers. Some were suggesting that maybe these numbers were anomalous and evidence of uh, some kind of fraud. A lot of these voter registrations were done without proof of ID, were done in ways that seemed a little bit dubious. But people ought to look into that, whether it's fraudulent or not. If the Democrats are registering, 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 flooding the country with foreigners, maybe those are related issues, maybe they're separate issues. If they are just turning out votes, if they are getting their hands on ballots, if they are, if they are doing the mechanics that will immediately matter at the ballot, ballot box to decide the election— then maybe they don't need to win the debates. Maybe they don't need to poll very high. Maybe they don't need to uh, convince people that Biden's economy or border or foreign policy is, is good. Because what matters is election day. What matters is who counts the votes. And if, if the Democrats right now are being sincere when they say, it is obvious that Joe Biden's going to win. If they really mean that, then the only explanation is that they have a trick up their sleeve.
because if it were a fair fight today, there is not a chance that Joe Biden would win. Today is Theology Thursday. The rest of the show continues now. You do not want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles, Canada WLES at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. 